In the history of witch trials, we've seen so-called witches punished or executed in some truly dark ways. Some were hanged, others burned, and there were cases of women being imprisoned, usually naked, as members of the church searched their bodies for the mark of Satan, which would implicate them as a witch. But there are a few cases of other lesser known and more sinister means of deciding whether someone was a witch or not. One such case revolves around Grace White Sherwood, often known as the Witch of Pungo, the very last person known to have been convicted of witchcraft in the state of Virginia. Before we delve further into occult history explained, a quick message from the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. A VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and is a service provided by NordVPN that will encrypt your internet activity and also protect your identity while you're online. With so much of our sensitive information now stored online, from bank details to home addresses, internet security is a must-have for any browser of the web. NordVPN will ensure that all of your internet usage is redirected through a specially configured remote server, which will see your IP address hidden and encrypt all the data you send and receive. This means that your data will be unreadable to any would-be hackers, so there's no need to worry about connecting to the Wi-Fi at the airport or at your local coffee shop, because with NordVPN, your passwords, banking details, credit card numbers, and other private details will all be encrypted. Even if some super cyber hacker was able to intercept this data, they wouldn't be able to make any use of it. You will also be protected against your own internet service provider, who has access to everything that you do online. In fact, they may even sell this data onto advertisers, government agencies, and other third parties. With NordVPN, however, you can rest at ease knowing that your data is safe from prying eyes. As if that wasn't great enough, NordVPN can also make your IP address appear like you're somewhere else from around the world. With over 5,000 servers worldwide, NordVPN gives you the ability to manipulate your IP address to appear in a completely different country, which is great if you're in an area where content is region locked or restricted, or if you're away from home and can't access your favourite shows because of country-specific restrictions. With a simple click, you can assimilate your IP address into another country, allowing you to access the full scope of the internet as it should be. NordVPN is available through both iOS and Android platforms and is totally affordable with my 75% off a 3-year plan link. Just go to nordvpn.com forward slash the legend and use the discount code the legend to receive an extra month totally free. Remember, without a VPN, your connection is fully open and you may be vulnerable to strangers having access to your data. Is this really a risk you can take? Get peace of mind knowing that your data is encrypted and your IP address is hidden and enjoy the benefit of being able to bypass country specific content with NordVPN. We know little about the childhood of Grace Sherwood, other than that she was born in around the year 1660 and would go on to become a farmer, though would also work as a healer and a midwife. She was known for the uncommon practice of herb gathering, for which she would use to heal those who were sick, as well as the animals who had grown poorly. She would marry a well-respected planter named James, and the couple would have three sons together in Pungo, Princess Anne County. While the family were poor and lived in a mostly uninhabited area amongst those who had no land at all, they were able to sustain their lives. But James died in 1701, and Grace inherited his land. Cases of witchcraft were not a new thing to the state of Virginia, for reports of women being arrested for being witches date back to 1626, a whole 14 years before Sherwood's birth. But Virginia was never big on witchcraft trials, when in comparison to the witch trials of Salem, where several executions had taken place. Instead, religious leaders of Virginia were far more interested in stampeding out gossip and slander, seeing them as threats to the social stability of the land. By Sherwood's time, Virginia courts were reluctant to hear accusations of witchcraft, and were even more reluctant to condemn a woman to death on these bases. Furthermore, Evidence provided by supernatural means, such as visions from God or dreams, were not accepted as legitimate forms of proof, unlike in the Salem witch trials, 
and other trials around the world. Instead, it was the accuser who would actually carry the burden of providing evidence of guilt, as opposed to the accused having to provide evidence of their innocence. If the accuser was unable to provide sufficient proof, they could be liable for slander and sued by the accused, something which Grace Sherwood frequently did. Just before the death of her husband James, Grace was accused of witchcraft, where Richard Capps, a fellow farmer, accused Grace of casting a spell, which resulted in the death of his bull. He was not able to provide substantial evidence for his claim though, and Sherwood filed for defamation of character in 1697. She would again be accused of witchcraft a year later, in 1698, where Sherwood was accused by a neighbour named John Gisburn of enchanting his pigs and his crops. Sherwood would sue John Gisburn under the same grounds as suing Richard Capps a year earlier. It seemed that accusing or blaming Grace Sherwood for mishaps would become a common ploy used by her neighbours. For that same year, neighbour Elizabeth Barnes alleged that Sherwood had turned into a black cat, entered her home and then whipped her before leaving through the keyhole. The allegation went unresolved. Interestingly enough though, of all the files for defamation by Sherwood, none were actually successful, meaning she received no compensation. The courts would simply dismiss the cases, and the Sherwoods would be responsible for the court-related costs. The only court case she appears to have won was against her neighbour, Elizabeth Hill, for whom she sued for assault and battery when the two were engaged in a physical altercation in 1705. There were obviously tensions in the community, where Grace Sherwood was being seemingly blamed for all of the mishaps. It's noted that while the courts were not interested in trialling women for witchcraft, they had grown tired of Sherwood constantly raising court cases against her neighbours. It might be the reason as to why they eventually did order her to appear in court, when in 1706, Elizabeth Hill accused Grace of casting a spell on her unborn baby, causing her to miscarriage. In March 1706, the Princess Anne County Justice impaneled two juries, both of whom were made up of women. The first group were ordered to search Grace's home for anything that might have indicated that she was a practicing witch. The second group were ordered to examine her body, to see if the devil had marked her in any way, but both of these parties ultimately refused to do so. Eventually, a jury of 12 women was put together by the court, who examined Grace's body, only to find what they claimed were marks not like any they'd ever seen before. They concluded that these marks were indeed the marks of the devil, and thus came to the conclusion that she was indeed a witch. It should be noted though, that the forewoman of this jury was none other than Elizabeth Barnes, the same woman who had accused Sherwood of witchcraft and turning into a black cat to assault her. The authorities were not keen on declaring Sherwood as a witch though. By May in 1706, the country justices had decided that there were no particular signs of witchcraft by Sherwood, but that it was certainly suspicious that many had accused her of the act. After all, there is no smoke without fire. She would be taken into custody nonetheless, and by July 5th of 1706, was ordered to take part in a trial by ducking, though with her consent for which she agreed to, perhaps if only to put an end to these witchcraft claims once and for all. She was also taken to Lynn Haven Parish Church, placed on a stool, and ordered to ask for forgiveness for her witchery. But Sherwood only said, I be not a witch, I be a healer. On July 10th, 1706, Sherwood was taken to a dirt lane known as Witch Dunk Road near Lynn Haven River. News of Sherwood had spread, and the event attracted many people from all over Virginia, many who jeered her as she appeared, and chanted, Dunk the Witch. According to the dunking rules, if Sherwood floated, then she would be declared guilty of witchcraft. If she sunk, then she would be deemed innocent, and quickly pulled from the river. Five women examined her naked body for any devices that she might have had on her person to help free herself, or to help herself sink. They then covered her with a sack to preserve her modesty in front of the crowd. Six of the justices that had ordered her ducking rode in one boat with Sherwood 200 yards into the river. 
before Sherwood was shot from the boat, she was said to have stated, Before this day be through, you will all get a worse ducking than I. When she was cast into the river, bound by a rope no less, she quickly floated to the surface. The sheriff of the town then tied a 13 pound bible around her neck, which did cause her to sink, but in order to save herself, Sherwood was forced to shred her restraints, allowing her to return to the surface. But of course, given that she'd had to have broken free from her restraints, and given that she'd floated to the surface even after a bible had been placed on her, it convinced spectators that she had to have been a witch. It should also be noted that this event took place in the morning, under the clearest and bluest of skies. But when Sherwood was pulled from the river, a sudden downpour of rain drenched the onlookers, alluding that Sherwood had cast some sort of weather spell, given her earlier statement that everyone would receive a worse ducking than she. With all this in mind, Grace Sherwood was jailed. What happened to Sherwa during her imprisonment is not known, as many of the records appear to have been lost. It was understood that she would only be jailed until a future trial was determined, but there is no record of any trial existing. A record exists detailing an order that she was to pay a man named Christopher Cock £600 of tobacco on September 1st, 1708, but the reason for this is not specified. Others believe that she had been released sometime in or before the year 1714, since in that year, she is recorded as having paid taxes on her property. She would live there for the remainder of her life, mostly isolated, until her death in 1740, at around 80 years of age. As legends go, Sherwood's sons were said to put her body near the fireplace of her property, when suddenly, a gust of wind came thundering down the chimney. Her body then disappeared, and in its place was a cloven hoof print. Other sources claim that Sherwood's body actually lies in an unmarked grave under some trees in a field near the intersection of Pungo Ferry Road and Princess Anne Road in Virginia Beach. There have since been many tales though of the devil taking her body, as well as unnatural storms that plague the area. There has also said to have been an influx of stray black cats, that loitered around her grave in the years after her death. It's said that the people would actually kill these cats, seeing them as omens, or spawns of the devil, which may have led to the rat and mice infestation that was recorded in Princess Anne County in 1743. Her home remained standing for over 200 years before being burned by vandals. All that remained by the early 2000s were the brick chimneys which were demolished in late 2002. A few bricks and part of the foundation of her home is all that now remains. A statue has since been erected in her honour, close to the courthouse and the point of her ducking. It depicts her with a raccoon to show her love for animals, and a basket of rosemary to show her love for herbs and gathering. Rosemary may also have been chosen because of a local legend in Virginia Beach, which states that all of the rosemary growing there had come from a single plant which Sherwood had tended to. Governor Tim Kaine eventually pardoned Grace Sherwood as late as July 10, 2006, on the 300th anniversary of her conviction, and restored her good name and recognised that she was wrongfully convicted. There don't appear to be any paintings or descriptions of Sherwood, though some contemporary accounts describe her as tall and attractive, possessing a strong sense of humour. She was more like a man in some senses, opting to wear trousers instead of a dress, given that most of her time was spent working on her farm. This wasn't exactly common at the time, nor was herb growing, so it isn't hard to imagine how the other women of the time may have perceived her as odd. The combination of her attractiveness and her choice to work the farm would invoke the attention of many men, most of whom were possibly fascinated that she, a pretty woman, demonstrated the same tenacity for farming. Sherwood biographer Belinda Nash suggests that Sherwood's female neighbours were jealous of the attention and affections that she was receiving, some of which may have been coming from their own husbands. Therefore, it is not so hard to imagine that they would wish to be rid of her, and that the tales of her witchcraft would serve as a way for them to achieve this. But what did you think of Grace Sherwood, the Witch of Pongo? Do you believe that she was an actual witch, given that she was accused by so many? 
Or was this really just the result of the scorn and fury of some very jealous women? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. Until the next time guys.